Thank you, Eric. Another, another day in paradise, right? Oh, got to turn the switch on. I thought I'd just talking loud enough I wouldn't have to. Oh, there we go. Another day in paradise, right? God, what the weather is. It's fabulous. Just absolutely fabulous. Now you know why the mafia always wanted to come to Del Mar in the wintertime, right? <laughs> Wonderful stories about how the mafia guys would come here and they'd stay over to La Costa and rub shoulders with uh, J. Edgar Hoover and his boyfriend over here at Del Mar. And, <laughs> and movie stars at the same time. I mean, God, is America a wonderful country or what? <laughs> the FBI guy rubbing shoulders with the mafia. Uh, anyway, uh, what's going on? Well, I thought today I should give you a little bit of a wake-up call maybe about where agriculture fits in in California. Uh, you know, if you look, go back in this California history, and I am a student of California history, fabulous history, fascinating stuff. If you go back in there, you find that even though the gold rush kind of was the signature event in California, kind of put California on the map for the rest of the world, there was really another rush going on about the same time, and that was the land rush to go to California and farm. In fact, if you recall, the men of the Donner Party, they got trapped up in the mountains and had to dine on each other a little bit uh, to survive, some of them. I hope they didn't kill anybody. They just killed, just ate the dead ones, I guess. Well, those were wealthy farmers from Illinois. And they had hollowed out the posts in their cabins, in their, on their, excuse me, in their wagons, and filled them with gold coins to buy land in California. That's where they were headed. They were coming here to acquire land and become California farmers. I often wondered what happened to those gold coins, by the way. Who knows? And so while the gold rush didn't last very long, and it still kind of reverberates in California, the land rush, as it were, continued on strongly. And California developed this really terrific agricultural economy during the latter part of the 19th century. One of those people who came to California for the gold rush, as a matter of fact, and uh, wound up as a farmer was my cousin, Hugh Glenn, a uh, distant cousin, obviously. And uh, he wound up farming. Think about this. In the 1870s, he had 50,000 acres of wheat land in the upper Sacramento Valley. He was known as the Wheat King of California. And he kind of invented the whole idea of California agriculture, of being on a large scale, highly capitalized, uh, scientific, and also very export-minded. He even had his own fleet of ships that took his wheat to England. Uh, he really invented the idea of uh, the think big California agriculture. And uh, I often wonder what would have happened had he not been murdered, but that's another story altogether. But, uh, so we saw, we saw this emergence of agriculture in the, in the late 19th century in places that when you first looked at them, you didn't think there would be agriculture. I mean, who could have envisioned that the Imperial Valley would have become so productive in agriculture? I mean, this was this like trackless desert. Even the San Joaquin Valley was really a, basically a desert originally until water was developed in the foothills of the Sierra and brought water into the valley. And farmers became, during that period, during the post-gold rush period, California farmers became an immense political power in the state. Through their organizations, primarily in those days, the Grange, which still exists. In fact, my brother-in-law is the state Grange master, which interestingly enough, uh, I don't know, he has known nothing about farming, but he's a state Grange master. And through the Grange and other organizations, developed a tremendous presence politically that made itself felt in uh, Washington and in Sacramento very, very strongly. I mean, you have to remember that in those days, 
Southern California was an agricultural area. All of it, not all these areas that have been since paved over. At one point, Los Angeles County was the most productive agricultural county in America. Think about that, Los Angeles County, because of all the uh, citrus fruit. And as the 19th century turned into the 20th century, this power of the farm community became entrenched, as it were, in Sacramento, where the farm groups took on what was then the most powerful interest group in the state, which was the Southern Pacific Railroad, and whooped them. Was instrumental in getting the passage of a uh, a commission to set railroad rates that later became the public, State Public Utilities Commission was instrumental in the reform movements of the initiative, the referendum, and the recall. This is why Gray Davis found himself recalled because the farmers put that in the law that you could recall somebody. So that Gray Davis got recalled in 2003 as governor. First, first and I don't know very last, but the first governor to ever suffer that fate. And of course we have 17 measures on next week's ballot, most of them initiatives that flow out of the initiative reform that was adopted in California at the insistence of the farm community a century ago. So you are to blame for having all those measures on the ballot, whether you know it or not. And the influence of agriculture in the state's economic and political arenas continued on in the 20th century, right up till near the end of the century. It was because of political action by the farm community that California got the federal government to build the Central Valley Project, Shasta Dam and all the other elements of the Central Valley Project that brought water from north and eventually set the stage for the California aqueduct that brought that Northern California water to the south when the state came along with its own water project later on during the governorship of Pat Brown. It was all done by the farm community. When I first uh, went to the Capitol, did I went to the Capitol or I came to the Capitol? I'm not quite sure which. In 1975, just as Jerry Brown, Pat Brown's son, was beginning his first governorship, or Brown 1.0, as I like to refer to him, uh, the farm community was still very, very influential in politics in Sacramento. It was indicated by the fact that Jerry wanted to do a farm labor law, set up the Far Agricultural Labor Relations Board and have a farm labor law because there was no federal labor law governing farm workers. But he couldn't do it without the agreement of the Farm Bureau and other farm organizations at that time. It would have been politically impossible to do that law without the acquiescence of the farm community, the agricultural community. Because the agricultural community retained a very, very strong presence in the legislature in both parties, and he had to deal with it on that basis. It had to happen that way. And that was in 1975. That was in, you know, that was uh, three quarters into the 20th century. The farm community was very, still very, very influential in politics in California. And remained so for another two decades or so. At least another two decades. But there's a big break point in California politics. And one that I don't think anybody recognized was occurring at the time but soon became evident. The break point occurred in the middle 1990s. What happened in the middle 1990s? Well, the end of the Cold War happened. And when the Cold War ended, it had an enormous impact on the economy of Southern California because the Pentagon, Pentagon prior to that point was spending 20% of all the money it spent all over the globe in California. It was an enormous part of the California economy, particularly the Southern California economy. 
And when the Cold War ended, we started, they started shutting down military bases. Uh, they started canceling procurement contracts, which was where the big money was. And it devastated the defense economy in Southern California. And as a result of which, about a million people, more than a million people actually, packed up and left California during that period. They were aerospace workers and their families. They said, our jobs are gone. There's nothing else here. Let's get out of Dodge. And they did, by huge numbers. Now, our population didn't go down because we were also experiencing at that time a particularly strong inflow of migrants, immigrants from other countries, legal and illegal. And so, while our population growth slowed, it didn't stop. But the effect on particularly Los Angeles County was immense. And the economic and socioeconomic impact was then translated into a political impact. And this is what happened. Up until that time, up until the mid-1990s, Los Angeles County, remember Los Angeles County has a quarter of the state's population, more than a quarter now. And it was, however, kind of politically unimportant. You say, how could that be true? It was politically unimportant because in big statewide elections, particularly for governor and president and U.S. senator, it was neutral. Democrats would win by a slight amount, or Republicans would win by a slight amount, but it basically canceled itself out. And the election was really, those elections were decided elsewhere. And Republicans depended on what was known as the fish hook. Now, you have to imagine what map of California in your mind. Coming down the central and eastern parts of the state, from Oregon and Nevada all the way down to Mexico, and then hooking into San Diego and Orange counties. That's the fish hook. And Republicans won elections in California consistently because of the fish hook and because Los Angeles County was neutral. The fish hook would offset the Democratic voting Bay Area more than offset it. As a result, Republicans won elections in California. During, between 1980 and 1990, there were 10 top of the ticket elections in California. That's for governor or president or U.S. senator, the big offices. Republicans won eight of the 10. The only two exceptions were two re-elections by Alan Cranston, Senator Alan Cranston. Pete Wilson won a Senate seat and then later the governorship and re-election to the Senate. That's three of them. George Duke Mason won election and re-election as governor. And Ronald Reagan won twice in the state for president and George Bush Sr. won once in California. Think about that as you contemplate that probably Hillary Clinton's going to win California's electoral votes next week by about 25 or 30 percentage points. California used to be, if not a red state, more or less a purple state. Republicans did very well. And then it stopped happening in the mid-90s. What happened was Los Angeles County stopped being neutral. The outflow of conservative voting aerospace workers and their families, nominal Democrats, most of them, but Republican voters, Democratic registrants, Republican voters, they called them Reagan Democrats. They left, and in overnight, in the space of two election cycles, Los Angeles County turned sharply to the left, politically. Now, why do I know all this? Well, because I wrote a chapter of a book about the whole thing, <laughs> did all the research on it. And as LA County, when you tilt one quarter of the population of California, you tilt the entire state. Basically, that's what happened. And between, after 1996, starting in 1998, California became bluer and bluer and bluer and bluer and bluer. And now today, Democrats hold every single statewide office. They hold commanding majority of the state's congressional seats. And two thirds, give or take, 
of the seats in the legislature. It might be more than two-thirds by next week. It's slightly under two-thirds today. Two-thirds of the seats in the legislature. And California is as blue a state as Massachusetts. Or what other blue state? Well, Maryland or someplace like that. Over the space of basically one generation, a complete political turnaround. And the people who came into the legislature from Los Angeles County after this big turnaround, when the LA County started sending lots of new people to the legislature as they vote district after district that had been Republican became Democratic. Many of them Latino and many of them coming out of the labor movement and coming into the legislature with a visceral dislike of farmers. Believing that farmers were exploitive, they were, had been schooled in the lore of the United Farm Workers Union and the movement. Because remember the UFW was not just a labor union, it was, it stylized itself and still does stylize itself as a civil rights movement, not merely a labor union. And came to Sacramento with an attitude of, we want to, I don't think punish farmers exactly is the right word, but right the wrongs as they saw them. And so you started seeing a, a, a steady stream of legislation that was aimed at several things. Uh, it aimed at, first of all, trying to make the UFW a real player in agricultural economics because it had not done very much very well on its own. So changing state labor laws to make that to make it easier to organize farm workers. And then most recently you've seen such things as the minimum wage increase and the legislation that uh, changed the overtime rules for farm workers. Now, unto themselves, you know, you can argue those things pro and con, but what they illustrate more than anything, I think, is that the farm community, the agriculture community of California, doesn't have the same kind of political influence, clout, if you will, that it once enjoyed, and had, had enjoyed for 150 years, when you think about it. And it's a different game today. And you, you, you folks are not the only ones to feel that impact, certainly. But other groups that have kind of sensed the same kind of, saw the same kind of sea change, same kind of atmospheric change, reacted more vigorously to adapt to it. Particularly the I would call it the non-agricultural business community, for lack of a better phrase. The State Chamber of Commerce and other business groups surveyed the situation in the 90s as it was occurring, said, wow, the world is changing. We can no longer depend on Republican governors uh, or Republican legislators to protect our interests in the capital. So we have to change our way. Now I have to digress here a little bit to explain what, what the capital is all about. The capital is all about money and power. It's a very unsentimental place and it's basically a very illogical place. Logic means nothing in politics. There is political logic which has nothing to do with ordinary logic. But mostly it's a kind of a zero-sum game. It's a place where the, the combat that goes on in the capital every year is a combat over money, mostly, over power somewhat. And at the end of the year, there are winners and there are losers. And it's a very unsentimental place. It's either you win or you lose. You're either eat or be eaten. That's the way it is. 
Now, it shouldn't be that way, obviously. You should have people, high-minded people, who think of the larger picture and context and the, the state as a whole, and what's good for California and everything. Well, it doesn't work that way. It's win or lose, eat or be eaten. Dog eat dog. And the biggest game, the biggest of those conflicts is in general, it works something like this. There are four big interest groups on the left side of the political ledger. Labor unions, environmentalists, trial lawyers, personal injury lawyers, and consumer advocates. And they're a kind of a wholly owned subsidiary of the trial lawyers, but that's another story. Each year, these four groups put their agenda into the form of bills that are introduced in the legislature. And many of those bills, as you might expect, are considered to be hostile by the business community. So the game every year is those four groups play offense, the business community, business employer community plays defense. And at the end of the year, you tote up who wins and who loses. And the business community has been remarkably successful over the last 20 years during this transition period in staving off what they would consider to be the worst possible outcomes. In fact, every year the state chamber publishes a list of bills, usually two to dozen to sometimes three dozen bills, they call job killers. They're like the worst of the worst as far as they're concerned. And those same bills, not surprisingly, tend to be the top priority items of those four groups, the big four, I'll call them. And they do battle over those things. Well, the chamber has been, they started doing that in 1999, remember when this transition was just starting to make itself evident. And they've been remarkably successful, a very small percentage. They've batted about 900 during that period. And they're pretty proud of it too, I want to tell you. Only about 10% of those bills have become law. Usually speaking, maybe two a year, something like that, including this last session, that was also true. Now, some of those that became law are pretty, pretty important bills, don't get me wrong. Like the minimum wage bill, for example, was one. Like the bill that created the whole uh, anti-greenhouse gas program in California, signed by uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger back in 2006 and recently reauthorized in a new legislation. So there's some pretty good sized bills that have become, important bills that have become law. But over time, they have staved off about 90% of those, those bills, much to the chagrin, much to the anger, by the way, of those four groups. Now, how have they been able to do that? They've been able to do that because they recognized that the, the legislature was going to be controlled by Democrats forever. And that Republicans no longer counted in the scheme of things. Therefore, they started in the, in the 90s cultivating a group of Democrats, a block of Democrats that were friendly to business. Now, people call them BDs for business Democrat. Some people call them the mod squad, whatever. And over the last decade and a half or so, they have cultivated, maintained, and in some cases uh, enlarged this group of business-friendly Democrats. And occasionally it, it manifests itself in an actual showdown vote of some time. But about 99% of the time, when these bills that the business community opposes die, they don't die after some spectacular floor debate and vote. They just suddenly just kind of vanish in the dead of night. They're dropped. But the reason they get dropped is because the sponsors of the bills knows they can't get the votes to get them through the process to the governor's desk. And this year's crop, for example, uh, only 
go back and look at it. I think two bill, two of the job killer bills got to the governor's desk. He signed one of them and he vetoed the other out of however many, well, a couple of dozen bills that started out the year. And so it was a fairly typical year in that regard. Most of the action in this year's elections, legislative elections around the state, and remember there are 100 legislative seats up, 80 in the Assembly and 20 in the Senate. There are about, the real actions in maybe a dozen of those seats and the real, real action are over conflicts to determine whether that group of business Democrats will expand or contract. Most of those are Democrat versus Democrat legislative elections because another thing occurred, sponsored again by the business community, although very quietly, the top two primary system. The top two primary system makes a world of difference in legislative elections. Previously, what would happen in a Democratic district, okay, you know, you, you can look at a legislative district, you can look at 95% of the legislative districts and know which party is going to win the seat going in. And so it, prior to the top two primary system, all the big four had to do was be get one of their people nominated in that legislative seat and it was guaranteed the election in November was a formality. It was all over once you won the primary. Under the top two system, that's not true necessarily. Because in these democratic districts that you know is going to elect a Democrat, the top two finishers in the primary will face each other in November. And that gave the business community an opportunity to back a moderate Democrat who then might win with the votes from Republican voters and independent voters. And that's how they have been able to nurture this group of BDs, as they're called. And, and this year's elections has another flock of those things going on. The most important of which is occurring over in San Bernardino County, where one of the BDs, Cheryl Brown, is actually being challenged by the big four in the top two primary herself. It's a kind of a test case as to whether they can take out some of the BDs in these elections. She, they probably will not succeed, but it's an, it's an interesting case. Now, there's another element to all of this. And the other element is most of these BDs are either black or Latino. Very, very interesting development. And so then the intra-party competition within the Democratic Party is also to some extent an ethnic conflict as well. And it, it approves one of my axioms of politics, and that is that nature abhors a vacuum. And when you have a one-party situation, whether it's a one-party state or a one-party county or a one-party city or whatever, when there's no real competition between Democrats and Republicans, then the dominant party starts dividing itself into factions and setting up quasi-parties. So the BDs are essentially a quasi-party within the Democratic Party. Much hated by the Democratic Party establishment, by the way. And the, the, the key to survival in a one-party situation, as the business community has recognized and exploited, the key to survival is finding those fragmentation lines those, those, those places where there's a little bit of a rupture and then widening them out, taking advantage of those, those fault lines within the party itself. And that's why they have survived. And why they have, you know, they don't win all their battles, but they win enough that, that they consider that effort to be a success. In fact, it began at the, in the first election after the top two election was in 2012. And then the first, that first election under the top two system, the business community backed two Democrats who actually defeated incumbent Democratic Assembly members who were supported by the unions and the other parts of the Democratic establishment. It was a very big object lesson. It really kind of shook up the, shook up the game. And if the farm community or anybody else who feels put upon 
by the current legislative political situation looks to how to survival, it's that's the survival, is to find yourself some friendly, you, you can find friendly people within that party. If you find enough of them, then you can continue to survive politically. As I said, it shouldn't be that way. People should be making public policy for the greater good of the people of California, period. But it is that way. It's a, it's a, a, a game where very, very powerful interest groups do battle. And in the end, there are winners and there are losers. Let me say that this is no small matter. The totality of those bills that are introduced every year by the big four have stakes that are absolutely immense. We're talking about literally, in some cases, hundreds of billions of dollars. Hundreds of billions of dollars. So it's a very, very high stakes poker game. And that's why people take it seriously and why they're willing to in invest, if that's the correct word, spend tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to try to have an effect on that game. Spending it on campaign contributions to friendly candidates, spending it on lobbyists' fees, and all the other costs of political action. Because the stakes are truly immense. I tried to figure out once, what's at stake in political decision-making in Sacramento? And I got up to close to a trillion dollars a year uh, that I could quantify. I mean, the state budget alone, when you put all the money in the, all the money in the state budget, that's almost a quarter of a trillion dollars right there. Then they put in another hundred billion and or so in utility rates, another hundred billion or so in insurance premiums, and you know, you start adding all this up, you very quickly get past a half a trillion dollars and you start knocking on the door of a trillion dollars without too much difficulty. So the stakes in the political game in Sacramento are big stakes for anybody who's affected by political policy making. You're either in the game, you're either at the table or you're on the table being eaten. It's as simple as that. If you can't get at the table, then you are, you're putting a big sign on your back saying, eat me or kick me or something. Again, it shouldn't be that way, but it is. And it all, it, it, it's then left to every interest group in the state. And how many interest groups are there in the state? You can't even begin to count them. There are 1,200 lobbyists working the Capitol. 10 lobbyists for every legislator. They represent something in excess of 10,000 different separate interest groups. Everybody has a lobbyist in Sacramento for one reason or another. I'm a boat owner. There's a boat owner's a California lobby. Uh, and so forth. Everybody has a lobbyist in Sacramento. But how influential they are is not equal. Everybody may have a lobbyist, but not everybody is equal in the halls of government. It's a very complex, high stakes poker game. And like I say, you either wind up being an eater or be eaten in that game. Now I'm going to stop right there. Uh, Answer any questions I can about my premise there, what I've just been told you, or anything else about politics in California, whether it's water or bullet train or anything else that's on your mind. Yeah, yes ma'am, you ladies first. So why do you think the PDs are black? I'm sorry, sir. Why are the PDs black and Hispanic? Oh, why are the BDs black and Hispanic? Because the districts that they represent tend to be uh, kind of moderate in their political leanings. They don't tend to be really, really liberal or really, really conservative. They're Democratic districts, but they're not, they're not Democratic districts in Beverly Hills, let's put it that way. There are places out there in San Bernardino County, and a lot of them from the interior of California, uh, from places like Fresno and Bakersfield and, and, and so forth. And so they tend to be areas that are kind of, kind of conservative in a way to begin with. And so they, they are the ones that get, uh, they get, those that become the targeted districts. Uh, they tend to, a lot of them be low income districts. 
oddly enough. Maybe people who, who value the idea of ep economic opportunity, I don't know, but I mean, it's a bad effect, but the vast majority of those BDs are, are in fact uh, Latino or black. Uh, and by the way, there's an effort underway to create a similar group in the Senate this year, and it looks like it might be successful. I think you're going to wind up with a, maybe about six people in a, in a kind of a mod squad group in the Senate this year as well. Uh, now, six doesn't sound like very much, but it's actually quite a bit when it's only a 40-member house. It can, it, it, can, it can hold the balance of power on a lot of things. Uh, yeah, you had your hand up. Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, do I see any practical ways for the farm community to increase its influence? Yes, there are practical ways. Uh, you could, I, I don't know whether it's, I don't know that it's possible, but I'm just throwing this out hypothetically. You could make an alliance with people like the State Chamber of Commerce and become part of their BD cultivation effort, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, I think that the farm community very often takes its, and, and you're not the only one, there's a, there's a tendency among many groups to feel that they're doing the Lord's work. In your case, you're growing food, you're growing fiber, and therefore you should have the virtues of what you do should be self-evident that don't need magnification. But as a matter of fact, there is no self-evident morality in Sacramento. And it has very little to do with abstract worth, moral worth anyway. It's about power and the use of that power and money. And just because you think you're doing the Lord's work doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have status in the political circles. You have to go out and actually cultivate it. And I want to tell you, in years past, in decades past, the farm community has understood that and has been very successful with it. It's only been in recent years that they've kind of got themselves overwhelmed. And a part of the thing, I think, is because of the changes in the nature of California's economy. Uh, agriculture, while it's a, a big industry, is by no means the biggest anymore, biggest economic activity. When I came to the capital, to show you the, the change, when I came to the capital, the farm community was very, very powerful. The horse racing community was very powerful. The healthcare industry was very unpowerful. The healthcare is now California's largest single economic activity. It's about, what do we consider the farm economy to be? $40 billion a year, $50 billion a year? The, the healthcare industry is five to six times as big. Think about that. It's the largest single economic activity in California. And it has become immensely influential. The nurses, the doctors, the hospitals, the medical insurers are all very, very powerful entities in Sacramento. Several of the ballot measures you have be voting on this year have to do with that lobby. Proposition 50, 50, 51, I can't remember. It's the one that actually continues a special tax on medical care. Uh, that's an indication of that power. So t over time, influence in politics ebbs and flows. People who are very powerful, like the horse racing industry, no longer are. People who were not powerful, they were so unpowerful, the medical people, that Democratic, legisla the Democratic legislative leaders would make Republicans the chairman of the health committee because it was such a nothing thing. And now it's the biggest thing in California. So circumstances change, and political circumstances change. And what was true one time is not necessarily true another time. That's why you have to kind of constantly reinvent yourselves and form new alliances and, and become a player in the game so that you're not left out when the decisions are, are made. And it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do. And it's an expensive thing to do. But you either do it or you don't, and usually the expense is a far, a tiny fraction. What is the economic impact of that overtime bill? I don't know what it is. I don't think anybody knows exactly what it is, but I would say it's in the billions someplace. 
if the agriculture community had spent a half a million dollars or something, I don't know what the number, to become, to be at that seat at the table, it might have been well worth it. But in contrast to what Jerry Brown had to get the farm communities okay to do farm labor legislation in 1975, he did not need that okay to sign that bill. Now, a different game, a different set of circumstances, a different lineup of players. And it is what it is. Yes, sir? You keep referring to the game and you refer to uh, terms uh, like job killers. And so all of this needs money. If the system is rigged to kill jobs, where is this money going to come from? See, you're thinking logically again. <laughs> Logic has nothing to do with politics. Self-evident virtue has nothing to do with politics. Politics is about power and money. You're thinking, you, you look, you're making a logical argument where in, a, in an arena in which logic is not respected. Only power is respected. It just doesn't work that. Now, yeah, I mean, you can say that about a whole variety of things. They're gonna kill the golden goose, right? Hey, as long as the golden goose is giving out gold, we're gonna spend it, you know? <laughs> I mean, politics is a very short range business, and it's a very unsentimental business, and it's a very illogical business in its practical forms. And, and it's something that goes on 365 days a year, not just during an election every other year. You have to be there, engaged all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, if you hope to survive in that atmosphere. It's not a one-time thing, and nothing is self-evident in that. You have to hammer everything home time and time and time and time again. Yes, sir? Uh, in relationship to water, I would like to know what you think uh, California should do about our water and in consideration of the future and global climate change. Uh, as, as we were discussing earlier, California gets a lot of water. What's this not Nevada? We're not Arizona. As a state, we get a lot of water. A lot of water falls out of the sky in the form of rain or snow on California. In a given year, in an average year, about 200 million acre feet of water will fall upon California. We have a drought, it's 150. Have a big year, it's 250. But it average out around 200 million acre feet. Of that, 70% will either evaporate or flow into the ground, leaving about 70 million acre feet to actually run off, either immediately, immediately during a rainstorm or slowly uh, from the melting of the snowpack. Of that 70 million acre feet, total human use is about 40 million acre feet. Agriculture uses about 30 million acre feet, and the other 10, actually about nine, is used by non-agricultural human use, taking showers, brushing your teeth, watering your lawn, commercial, industrial, all the other stuff. So that's the allocation of water as it stands right now. And that doesn't count the groundwater, which actually amounts to about a third of the overall water supply. Water in California is not a hydrological problem. It's not an engineering problem, it's a political problem. It's the trying to get the political will to allocate and price and distribute that water in some sort of rational basis. And it's very complicated because water in California is tied up in jillions of water rights and water contracts and all this sort of stuff. I mean, in any kind of logical world, for example, the Imperial Irrigation District would not have the legal right to take three quarters of the water from the, Sac from the Colorado River to which California is entitled, but it does. It gets 3.3 million acre feet of the 4.4 million acre feet that California can take out of the river every year. Logically, that makes no sense, but it is a practical fact, a legal fact of life right now. So the question is, should water be reallocated differently at the same time that we have more water storage because of global warming, we're probably gonna get 
more of our precipitation in the form of rain and less in the form of snow. So we're going to lose the natural reservoir of the snowpack, or at least a lot of it, and we should be building unnatural reservoirs to probably make up for that or to sink some of that water into the underground supply. Logically, but the water is not logical any more than politics is logical. We should be probably reallocating water. We probably should be concentrating agricultural water on the highest value crops and not on the lowest value crops. Does it make sense to, and I don't know the answer, this is a question rather than an answer. Does it make sense to use tremendous amounts of water to grow alfalfa and ship that alfalfa to China? Because essentially, we're shipping water to China when we do that. It may not make any sense. Maybe that water should be more expensive than it is. Maybe the rice growers up in the upper Sacramento Valley should not have full access to all water for virtually zero cost. But they have pre-existing water rights and so forth and so forth and so forth. Now, the state, because of the drought or as using the drought as a rationale, take your pick, is beginning to do this kind of a process. The first step on it, step on that path, is groundwater regulation, which, was, which is going to take years to implement, maybe even decades. But while that's going on, the next step is on the verge of beginning. And that is going to be probably Armageddon. It's going to be the war to end all other, the mother of all battles. And that's going to be over water rights. Whether water rights are absolutely sacrosanct and cannot be violated in any way, or whether, in fact, they can be abrogated in some way. The, when the State Water Resources Control Board laid down its conservation guidelines, there was a very small water district on the west side of the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta near Tracy that said, go stick it in your ear. We have senior water rights. You can't tell us what to do. And the board said, oh, yes, we can. And they said, no, you can't. And they were headed for a legal confrontation that would have settled the issue, perhaps have begun to settle the issue, of whether the state, whether water rights are inviolable or can, in fact, be abrogated. And both sides then kind of backed off. No, nobody wanted the World War III, I guess. But it's coming. It's coming. There's going to be some sort of a test case or something that's going to throw the whole issue of water rights into question. Now, if out of all of this, if out of groundwater regulation and, and water rights uh, reconfiguration and everything, you came up with a more rational system of water distribution that benefited everybody, that that took advantage of the fact that we do have quite a supply of water in California, if it's handled correctly, that might be a good thing. But like all other processes, it's going to be subject to that nasty old thing called politics. So when you open the door to groundwater regulation or you open the door to water rights recalculation, you better have a seat at that table because those who have seats are certainly going to be protecting their interests as best they can, and those who don't have seats will be the eaten once again. And this is the best, as big as it gets. When you talk about water, you're talking about something about, about probably about as important as it, it possibly can be, and it's coming. Because of the drought, because of global warming, because of a whole variety of things, the big confrontation over water. Now it's not going to be a like big bang. It's going to be something that happens over years and decades. But that confrontation is coming for certain. And there will undoubtedly be winners and losers. And uh, if you don't want to be a loser, you better be at the table. 